Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to another amazing night of learning. Um, my name is Michael Ben Malik. For those who are here for their first time, welcome aboard. You are about to go real deep into the world of Torah. And um, what we normally do again is we teach weekly a incredible book called Likutei Maharan, which is the holy, holy work of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Um, and uh, it's an incredible, incredible, incredible book that really is so holy and it really makes such an impact on your life. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later today in tonight's class. Um, the past two weeks, we went on a tangent and we went into an incredible book written by a Breslover Chassid who was born 70 years later after Rabbi Nachman passed away. His name is Rabbi Itzhak Breider. And him, to him, we, if you guys remember the first, the first, uh, first class we had, he wrote a book called The Seven Pillars of Faith. So for the past two weeks, we have been floating around in the world of Imuna and faith. And in a generation that we're in right now, there's so much craziness going on, uh, both on a worldly level and on personal levels with everybody having different type of challenges in their lives. Um, the Torah of Rabbi Nachman uh, is impacting our generation, I would say, more than most people are today. And this goes from all across the spectrum, whether you have the payas up to here or you're just, uh, you know, just tuning into Judaism now or you're halfway in between or you're Baal Tshuva or you've been at this for years and you're still thirsty and hungry for real spiritual knowledge and really going up the ladder in spirituality. So in this book, The Seven Pillars of Faith, there is a, so to speak, another book that Rabbi Itzhak Breider wrote. And it's called Seder Hayom, which means the order of the day, which is called in English, um, the life of a breast lover. Now, um, I want to start off, before I start off the part about this whole book and whatever, I want to say one incredible thing. And I'm going to say this, and I, say this, I said this before in the previous classes, I'm going to repeat it again. If you are here tonight, in this class, it's because Hashem wanted you to be here. That's why you're here, okay? There are many people that I speak to, and sometimes it's funny, I hear months later, sometimes a year later, and like, I heard your class, da -da -da -da, and, like, and, I like, and I changed my life, or, oh my God, you have no idea. Or, and so, so, I, so I say this, whether you guys are watching here now, for all of you are here, you're going to hear this later on, later on, whatever it is in your life. Um, God wants you to hear this class. Now, I think one more thing that's very important and apropos, we have two people here. I won't say your names, but they are here for the first time, right? How did they get here? Another tzaddik has brought these guys here to, to be in the class. And they said something that just struck a massive chord with me. Besides the fact that they're Latin, like I am, and that's okay, whatever, no big deal. But more importantly, they said to me, we started now looking at a book by Rav Aryeh Kaplan. And I want to tell you two amazing things about that. When I was, I am now, I could say, it, I'm 41. Wow, it's crazy. I feel like I'm 21, but when I was 40, I'm 41. Baruch Hashem, turning 42 very soon. Tu be'av, mark that on your calendars. Tu be'av. Um, and, and, um, and I was 22, 22 years old. And I remember that I started getting a copy of Rabbi Ari Arya Kaplan's books, the anthology, anthology one and two. He has all these books in one. And I remember started getting into it and started reading it. And for me, it was like opened up like new worlds, like, like, like as if like somebody opened up a pan, like a box of like, and like, you know, you open up a box of, and like all this light comes out. You're like, what? Judaism is like this? And I was not, you know, observant. I went from a traditional Jewish family, right? Latin, typical, typical Latin Jewish tra tra traditional family. And uh, Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan opened up my eyes. And, and to this day, you know, I'm just like, wow, always about him. Little did I know about Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan is that he was an important figure in also disseminating Rabbi Nachman's works in English. I was not into Breslov at all those times. I only got into Breslov, I would say, realistically about six years ago. Uh, and I went and I immersed myself all in. And, but he was a 
huge instrumental part in, in, in Breslov in the English world, uh, uh, an intense, super knowledgeable personal, person about all Rabbi Nachman's works. And so, you know, when you're talking about somebody who's coming in here, tell me why well, I just started, you know, reading Arya Kaplan and it's like, you're talking, we're talking the same language. Okay, you have to know that. And that's, this is a perfect example of saying to you, there's not, it's not by chance that you're here. And for all of you guys, yeah, I don't know everyone's story, but I'm just saying in general, there's, it's not by chance. So that's unbelievable. And with that being said, Rabbi Ari Kaplan from a level of like basics and opening up the world of Judaism and, and show, putting a light on it in a different light than we would normally been exposed to. Now you're going to go from like here to like here. You can't see me like this. So I'm trying to the monitor. <laughs> it's a very big difference, and but it's an incredible difference because what what the, what we're going to learn tonight is not easy stuff, but it's something that I feel like it's going to be uh, an incredible journey. Um, so going back to Rav Tisco Breiter, so he has a book called The Day in the Life of the Brussels Passage, and in it he has 27 line items. 27 line items of the things that, so to speak, a Breslov Hasid does in their spiritual practice daily. Now, I just want to be clear, and I say this very, like, sensitively. It doesn't necessarily mean just because he's Breslov, oh, you can't do it. On the contrary, all this means to me, and as we're going to go through it, it's going to be many, many, many weeks. Okay, this is a journey. We're going to go through a lot of ideas and a lot of different type of high level practices and all these different things. If you can feel like, yeah, I can connect to that, great. And if you can't, it's also okay. I wanna be clear, that's number one. Number two, I wanna also say that all of this stuff that we're gonna be constantly talking about is something to like, so to speak, like a step-by-step -step opening up a new world of Judaism. When I got into Breslov and I started learning about so many different things like why didn't I why didn't I know that how come nobody taught me that why did I know this why didn't I know that and then you find out as you start going through the full Torah and the rabbis and the opinions and all a lot of things you're like your eyes open up but like why wasn't I taught this so that being said I just want to be clear because I could share my my love and my deep um, yearning in regards to growing closer to Hashem and, and learning these concepts. And tonight, specifically tonight, is a harder one for some people because we end, it's ironic, last class, we finished off the seventh pillar. Does anybody remember what the seventh pillar was? Attaching yourself to the tzaddik. Well, guess what? Tonight's first line item, which is obviously number one, is the concept of attaching yourself to the tzaddik. We're working, hmm? working We're working, yes, we're working. So with that being said, I want to uh, dedicate tonight's class in memory of my mother, Deborah Feige, Bat Shmuel, Zichron Al-Bracha, and Menachem Mendel Ben Elchanan, Zichron Al-Bracha. And may Hashem bring a complete refuah shlema to all the people that need it, both mentally and physically and spiritually. Okay. Now, with that being said, I want everybody to go ahead and you can look just one more thing. You see that cool picture in the front? Everybody was asking me, what's the deal? What, Michael, what's a keeper? Like I could have used, what's a day in the life of a breast where I would have showed you a guy in the field with long pace, like with his arms up like that. Like that could have been the picture. But the truth of the matter is two things. One, uh, and this is something I love about Brussels. You know, when you think about Judaism, you think about different Hasidic sects in general, different groups, right? People like to describe, whoa, I have to have, I have to have this Bekesha and I have to have this black hat and I have to, I have to dress like this. And, and like Brussels is not like that. You can be who you can be. You can practice who you want to be. You don't have to look like anybody. It's about what's inside. It's about your heart. It's about what's inside and your heart and your mind and your high level of connection to Hashem and living a full out life as a Jew. Okay, that's what Breslov is all about. So it's not about your physical appearance, although Rabbi Nachman had, you know, the payas and all that stuff. It's not like something where, like you have to be like this. On the contrary, you could be Spartic and be Breslov. You could be Ashkenazic and you could be Breslov. Okay, you can be anything. Right. As long as you understand that you're going to practice 
the teachings of what Rabbi Nachman of Breslov stressed, which we're going to talk about one of the main ones tonight, which is the concept of binding yourself to the tzaddik. What does that even mean? So with that being said, let me share my screen with all you guys here. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. You were speaking about the kippah, the famous kippah. What's the deal with the kippah, right? So this kippah, <laughs> this kippah that you're seeing is, give me one second. This kippah that you're seeing is actually an authentic kippah that Rabbi Nachman wore. It much, looks much cooler in, in color, but um, there were certain <laughs> items that were the assembly descended down to family members. My my own rabbi, Rav Nelson Maimon, Rav Chaim Kramer, both of my, my main rabbis who are my main main spiritual influencers when it comes to Breslov, their father-in-law through their family were brought down different items. So the Rabbi Nachman had a specific wine cup. He had a kippa. He had the famous chair that some that a wood guy made on this incredible chair that you could see it still today in the yeshiva in Yerushalayim of Breslov that they have it there. It just happens to be, but I could have chosen anything else. The reason specifically why I showed that keeper is because I can show you a picture. Like I said, I can show you a picture of a guy with the pay and all that stuff. It's not about that. It's about the teachings of Rabbi Nath, period. That's what it's all about. And that's the concept of a day in the life of a breast lover. So now with that being said, let me share my screen with you guys. You look at the second page that you see there. The second page is again, the picture of Itzhak Breider, and again, for those that were not there for the first class, again, it's important to just shout out who he was. And I'll just say it to you, and I'm trying to sum it up in two minutes. But Itzhak Breider was a chassid who was living and born in Poland, in Krakow, Lublin, sorry. And he was learning as a young guy, learning in the yeshiva of Chaim Lublin. Huge, incredible yeshiva. If you guys been there for the March of Living and stuff like that, you've seen it, you've been there. Um, he and, and inside of that shul specifically is also where Rav Chaim Shapiro started the Dafyomi and the whole nine yards. Rav Yitzhak Breider finds the Likutei Maharan book, which is the book that we learn about. And he gets really excited when he sees this book and reading this Torah. And he's like, what is this? I don't know who Rabbi Nachman is, but this is like incredible. Long story short, he starts, he, he puts it away, comes back the next day. He can't find the book. Can't find the book. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Two weeks later, he finds a commentary. Long story short, make it simple. He starts making correspondence with the people in Uman. Have you heard of Uman before? We'll get there. <laughs> it's like a long thing to talk about. So it speaks to the people from Uman and they tell him to come, come for Rosh Hashanah, which is what people do to make the pilgrimage to Rosh Hashanah if you're a Rabbi Nachman follower and you go to a city called Uman where he's buried. He goes there, becomes an, uh, an incredible, uh, now real chassid of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, goes back to Poland, creates a revolution and has thousands and thousands of people that become Breslover in Poland, in Ashkenaz city. And, and they, they start following the ways of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Eventually, when people cannot get into Uman, into the Russian, uh, because of the Russian, they completely stopped it. He ends up doing the Breslov gathering in Poland, in specifically that yeshiva, the yeshiva of Lublin, with Rav Chaim Shapiro, who did the whole Daf Yomi. He said, you guys can use my yeshiva for Rosh Hashanah, which is super cool. And, you know, just one more thing I want to point out for people that are watching, you know, just this is a really, really incredible thing. I do Dafyomi every day, but Dafyomi was started originally, I think it was in the 30s or 40s, around that time frame. Rav Chaim Shapiro was on that, around that time frame, right? The 20s, 30s, or 40s, something like that. But Rabbi Nachman in the late 1800s was already talking about that. He was saying specifically how a person needs to learn Torah. I mean, often has advice for like everything in your life. And Torah learning is one of those things that you can go, he has pages and pages and pages and pages of what Torah learning does, what you do, etc. But one of the things he said is a person should make an effort to try to get through as much learning Gemara daily, spending time, page a day, learn a page a day. Because why? You have more traction. Back in the day, people were learning. It took them like they maybe did one or two months their whole life because they would go do everything in depth. Rabbi Nachman did that, and therefore, Rav Chaim Shapiro appreciated a lot of what these Breslovers were doing, how they were reacting. It very much correlated a lot with what was going on there. Long story short, Rabbi Tzak Breider gets to the Warsaw Ghetto, becomes a main figure there, and is, at the end of his life, unfortunately and tragically, loses his life in Treblinka in the concentration camps. As a pure Imuna faith person, the people that know him, feel the stories about him are mind-boggling. 
a huge, huge sadik and a big pleasure. And for me, it's a, it's an honor and a, and a really like to me to, to have his words come out uh, and, and his knowledge come out. It's a big course for me to do that in general. So I feel very privileged and I have the right to do that. So that's a little background about Itzhak Breiter, Zifran al Now, there's 27 things. There's 27 things. I can go through all of them right now, but it's going to take me a while because there's, I'm going to be saying 27 things, but we're going to, but what we're going to do is really go number one. I could have done this class and I just could have said, Hey, you know what? We're going to do, just go through all 27, little touch here, little touch there. But then I, I, I wouldn't be doing justice to the subject. Tonight's subject, number one is binding yourself to the top. So let's see what Rabbi Itzhak Breider has to say about that. So we're on the first page. So Rabbi Itzhak Breider says, and I'll say it in Hebrew and translate it in English. You have it there in front of you as well. Bechnisat halayla yomar hareni bot et Hashemit bara. At the beginning of the evening say, I want to serve God. And this is, I put it in bold and in big. Be'emet, I want to serve God in truth. Be'emuna, with faith. Ube'simcha, and joy. These three things that I'm telling you right now is not by chance that he's saying it. There's a lot of rationale behind it. When we say the Shema at nighttime, we usually say, Hashem, Elokecha, Mehmed. And what's the next line? The Emuna. Emuna is also another wording of saying prayer. Emuna, as we know, is faith. It's belief in Hashem. When it's dark at nighttime, what is the one thing you need? You need Emuna. You need faith. When things are dark in your life, and things are hard and it's difficult, we need to hold on to faith. The emet, truth, truth is represented by Torah learning. Emet is, is the seal. The Zohar says that emet is the seal of Hashem. You have to live a life of truth in all aspects of your life. When you go to Alam Haba, what's the first question that they ask you? Did you, do, did you deal honestly with business dealings? That's actually one of the first questions they're gonna ask you. Emet is everything. So emet, femuna, and finally, finally, besimcha. Simcha is joy. Simcha is the key to worship and service of God. A person cannot serve God when they're sad. You have to be happy always. Why is he saying these three things? Emuna, emet, emuna, simcha. What's the whole deal with that? Let's continue. We'll go to it right now. So he says in Hebrew, so he says, what do you have to do? He says, I hereby bind myself in my every thought, word, and action all through the day to the true tzaddikim, and in particular to the true tzaddik, the, ver the verbiage is called nachal nobea mekor chokma. If you hear breaths of songs, that's like all over the place, those wordings, which means the flowing brook, the source of wisdom. Now, if you look, take a look at the name nachal nobea mekor chokma. If you see it there, it spells nachman. I, you see, I kind of underlined it there. Nun chet, that's first letters, right? Sorry, nun, sorry, nach, sorry. Nun chet, mem nun, you see it there, right? So those are the, so to speak, the wordings that they use for him specifically. Now, and that's what he says. The first letters of the Hebrew word spell out Nachman, Rabbi Nachman, the son of Fega, may his merit protect us. So, and he finalizes the last thing by saying, before each prayer, say, I hereby bind myself in my prayer to the truth of Dikim in particular, etc." What are we talking about here? What does this mean? I'm binding myself to the tzaddik. And why is he using that as the first lesson of all lessons that we're going to talk about? Why? So I went to town and I said, you know what? We got to do some research. Let's find out what happens here. Why did Rabbi Nachman stress that? Why is it in Breslau liturgy like one of the most important things to do? Now, in practice, I just want to say, what does that mean practice? So number one, it means like this. When you bind yourself to the tzaddik, it means to literally create a relationship with him. We're going to talk about what does it mean to have a spiritual relationship with the tzaddik. That's number one. And I'm talking about like, honestly, like a real relationship, not like, like, a, you know, some faraway dream or something like legit. And number two, how do you do that? So one of the things that we, we talk about is the concept of 
learning the Torahs of the Rebbe. That's number one. The Rebbe says specifically, when you're learning the Torahs of, of his Torahs, it's literally as if he's looking right at you in the face when he's speaking to you, which is incredible. And it's also a very well-known thing that Gemara talks about it, that when a person learns a person's Torah and they quote him specifically, the lips of the person who is buried on the ground are moving when you're speaking. Mm. Overflowed cup. <laughs> I need the dot right now. I need some knowledge here. Okay. You have a, are you good? Okay. Okay. So, um, fine. So now with that being said, that's one idea. The second idea is like this, which we're going to learn about, which is the idea also before you pray. I do this every day. Many, many Brussels do the same thing. And we're going to understand also what's the reasoning why we do it. Hareni Mekasher, it's me, Right. When you're talking about, I'm binding myself to Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, right? Zechutoya Genelenu, and you're thinking about what does it mean to bind with him? What is that going to do for you when I'm binding everything I'm doing? So, in the, in the beginning of my day before I pray, right, there's a part in the Siddur that says, I have to bind myself to all the Jewish souls. That's one thing you do. And part two is, I want to bind myself to the tzaddik. So we're going to learn about all these things right now, what that means. I'm just telling you practically, what does it mean to bind myself? What am I doing? I'm learning it. I'm, I'm literally living, living what I'm learning. Now I'm just not learning. Going, okay, that's nice. Cool. Like I'm actually like, I'm trying to take these teachings and incorporating it in my life. Right. And doing the best that I can, because this is high level stuff. Let's not kid ourselves. A lot of the stuff that we're going to learn about, you're going to be like, it's not so easy and that's okay. Okay, it takes time to, to grow in, in spirituality. Okay, so now let's, we're going to have some fun. We're going to do some Likute Moharan for all my Likute Moharan junkies out there. I see all you guys over there. I got to make sure to give you guys some Torah, and that's what I did. Okay, so here we go. Take a look. And all I did is I, I took little sections, little snippets of different chapters to show what, it's, what, are, what are we talking about regarding binding yourself to the tzaddik. So here we go, chapter nine, Torah nine, section four. Rabbi Nathan says, Bechol tzarich kol adam lekasher tfilato, the tzadik ador. Every person must bind his prayers to the tzadikim of the generation. Ve'a tzadik yodea lechaven hashe'arim lehalot kol tfila u'tfila lesha'ar hashayich. And what happens, oh, by the way, as my style is from before, the gray are notes, like special notes that I put in, little insights and ideas. The white is the actual text itself. So take a look at this. When a, here, look at this th thought process. When a person requires special knowledge, you go to an expert, right? So doctor, right? I wanna go, to, doctor is a, is a, is a brain, brain surgeon, brain doctor, right? So, so if I wanna go to a brain doctor, I go to Dr. Saltzman, he's the best. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. His wife agrees. Okay. <laughs> so you go to the best. When you go to a court, who are you going to hire? You can say. <laughs> when you go to court, you look to get the best attorney to represent you. Is that not correct? Yes. So too, in coming before Hashem in God in prayer, we bind our prayer to the tzaddik who will present our case above. That's a big thing because people think that sometimes it's like, well, the tzaddik has nothing to do with me. Who is he? So we, we spoke about it a little bit in the last class. The, the human body, remember, keep this in mind. All of us are all connected, intertwined. We are all the human, human body. Imagine all the souls of the Jewish people are one body. And at the top, the head who runs the show are the tzaddikim on top. They're the ones that press, that so to speak, press the buttons. They're the ones who are like really, so to speak, remember the brain tells finger move. Yes or no? That's what the tzaddik, in, so to speak, on a universal level, that's what they do. So they're in the top. So the same way we're looking to have this, there's people got that are spiritually very sick. They're spiritually sick. They don't have any desire at all to connect to Hashem at all. Those are the ones that need to find a tzaddik who can illuminate them. 
That's their doctor. That's the spiritual doctor that they need. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, <clears throat> for the tzaddik knows how to match the gates to the prayers and raise each and every prayer to its appropriate gate. There are many gates in Shemaim that and on a simple level, right? We know that there's 12 tribes. Each tribe has its own gate, okay? Each tribe has its own gate. And obviously the tribes dissipated. However, we learned also from the Nusa Hari. The Nusa Hari was a comprehensive Sidur that was made, so to speak, as a universal Sidur that everybody, so to speak, it's the one that can go in through all the gates. That's on a prayer sitter level. But on a tzaddik level, if you're praying and you connect and you bind yourself to him, he can help you, so to speak, get that prayer where it needs to go. Okay, now for, for another class, we can, which will, it's a chapter two, it's an incredible, what are the secrets of getting your prayers answered? Rabbi Nachman goes to town on that and it's unbelievable chidushim and ideas. But one of those, I, one of those ideas is the concept, if I bind myself to the tzaddik, he's going to help my prayer get answered. Fine. Another idea, it's here in the gray. There's a concept, Yaakov gathers, Yaakov Avinu, gathers up all the prayers to its root. Rab Nassim says in Likutei Halacha, who's Rab Nassim? Rab Nassim is Rabbi Nachman's main student. If it wasn't for Rab Nassim, Rabbi Nachman's works would not be out today. He was the main, main person who put together and was able to transcribe or go over the Rebbe's works and put them out. He's an incredible tzaddik, so much to say about him. But he says in a book called Likutei Halacha that the prayers of the Jews are likened to a window that's what they are. And that Sadiq's prayers are like a precious jewel. The true Sadiq has the power to radiate the truth into everyone and raise every prayer to its appropriate gate. Okay. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, for each and every Sadiq is an aspect of Moshe Moshiach. Now, what does that mean that every Sadiq is an aspect of Moshe Moshiach? So we learned in Masechet Shabbat in the Gemara, the sage would say, you know how they would, they would go, Moshe, you said it well. What is that from? So like the, if you look at the Gemara, the Gemara would say like, Rav Yossi said to Rav Yezer, Moshe, you said it well. Why is he calling him Moshe? Rashi says there, you are to your generation what Moshe was to his. Meaning that a, a tzaddik, a sage in the Gemara, I news for you, was a high level tzaddik. Anytime you see that guy a Gemara, in the Gemara, a, a Tana, whatever it is, it's about a super high level individual. Okay? They would call each other Moshe, right? So that's a, Moshe is like a tzaddik emet. It's the high level tzaddik. That's what they used to call each other. So when we think about Moshe, we have to think about a, as a tzaddik figure, okay? And then he brings you a puzzle, Rabbi Nathan says, and it's written, this is in Breshi. Until Shiloh, AKA Shiloh means Mashiach comes. That's another puzzle. He's just throwing you a puzzle. And what does he say on that? Da Moshe. This is Moshe. In the Zohar, it says, until Shiloh, Moshiach comes. What, what are we doing? I want, I want, I, this is Likutei Maharan at its best. And I'm, it's a little bit harder because we don't have like the direct. It's nice when I have all the text with me in, in front of me. But I want to just quickly plug and play what he's saying. Number one, Moshe means Sadik. We covered that. Perfect. Next, until Shiloh, Moshiach comes. Zohar says, who's Shiloh? Moshe. How do we know that? Because Moshe and Shiloh, the gematria of both of those, gematria means the number, the number that correlates to every single letter. You add them up. Shiloh is 345 and Moshe is 345. Very good. So now Shiloh, which is synonymous with Mashiach, as the Zohar says, is also Moshe. Moshe, Shiloh, Mashiach. Three terms, three concepts. Look what I wrote in the, in the gray. By attaching the prayer to the tzaddik, the one who encompasses all the paths of prayer, one's words can ascend through the correct gate and reach its proper place together with all the prayers of the Jewish people. And I spoke about this in last class briefly, but it's so important. It's so important that it has to be said again. This is symbolized in the Torah's account of the, of the erection of the holy tabernacle, the Mishkan. What happened? Everyone brought their donation and contributed their share of the work, right? When we were in the desert, Moshe Rabbeinu is on the front lines of the Mishkan, okay? 
What does the tabernacle, the Mishkan represent? The Beit HaMikdash, what does it represent? The Korbanos, that's where it's happening. What do Korbanos represent? Prayers. Today's Korbanos are prayers. So back in the day, their prayer was, okay, here's some money. Now we can go buy an animal. Animal, Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu, you take that animal for me, please. It was only Moshe, the tzaddik of the generation, who was capable of assembling the tabernacle. Who was the one who put it all together? Moshe was the one who did it. Who, who put the, thing, the animals on? Moshe was the one who did it. Ah, so there's a concept of this high level individual who is really the one who's doing all like the big, big labor stuff. And then all of us, all B'nai Israel, would give it off to him. Well, isn't that kind of the same idea? The same idea that if I'm taking my prayers and now, so to speak, I'm binding them. Of course, it's going directly to Hashem. I'm only thinking about praying to Hashem. But in the beginning, beginning, I'm going to bind it with the tzaddik and hopefully the tzaddik can take it and put it where it needs to go. Does that make sense? For some people that have been, let's say, in the in the in the firm world for many, many, many years in their whole life, this concept is a little hard. It's not easy. What do you mean? I have to have somebody who's an intermediary? No, no, no. No, it's not an intermediary. It's just a basic concept in Judaism. As we're gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep showing you that there's something to be said about it. And in, in, in this world of wrestling, you'll see that it's one of the keys. I can personally tell you just from my own personal knowledge, I do this every single day. The more you learn this stuff, the more you engross in it, and then you start seeing things and then you're like, okay, this is amazing. You form this bond with the tzaddik. It's unbelievable. Let's continue. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, just to double down on what he's saying, um, Moshiach, who a kalu called filot, and Moshiach is comprised of all the prayers. So now we're connecting again, Moshiach and prayers. Why? Look at the word, look in gray. I wrote Moshiach is spelled the same word like the word like Messiah. Messiah to Messiah, siach means speech. It means prayer. Moshiach is an encompassing, it's the same word. Moshiach is the encompassing of speech and prayer. Let's explain more difficult Rabbi Nachman language to kind of break it down. Mashiach, we just said, now deals with prayer. So let's go back because we have to know plug and play. First concept is, we said, Moshe Rabbeinu. He is like the Sadiq. Moshe, Sadiq, Mashiach. Those are the three. Then we said Mashiach has to do with what? Prayer. Mashiach, Messiah. Same idea. Look what it says in Sanhedrin. By the way, side note, I put in the notes. There's a Pasuk in Isaiah. The Mashiach shall breathe of the fear of God. He will not judge by sight, nor by what he hears. The Talmud explains he's going to be judging by the sense of spell. When Mashiach comes, right? The word judgment, meaning he can be judging humanity, he could be judging whatever a person, whatever it is. It's all based upon what? Your nose, your smelling. He's going to smell you out. You know, you say that something doesn't smell right here. Why do we say that? Isn't that interesting? Something doesn't look right here. Something doesn't smell right, right? Mashiach is going to have that power of smell. And that is connected with also what? The fear of God. Rabbi Nachman says, Ki hem Prayer. Now he's going to make another connection with the nose. Prayer corresponds to your nose, chotem. Why? Look at the pasuk. Utehilati echetamlach. For my praise, I will restrain my anger for you. What does that mean? So if you look at the words, when you have two words together in a pasuk, you're allowed to use them as connectors. There's a connection that we have in this pasuk with the two words. Tehilati, tehila means what? Prayer. Echtam means what? Nose. Prayer, nose. That's a pasuk in Ishayahu. So we have another connection between speech, prayer, Mashiach, your nose. So look what this says here, the last gray. Echtam literally means I will plug my nose so as to prevent the smoke of anger from escaping. Just as a person's lifeline is his nose, without breathing, he cannot live. 
So too, one spiritual lifeline is prayer. Same thing. Again, prayer, knows, Moshe, Tzaddik, Mashiach. Moshe's, Mashiach's strength will be prayer symbolized by the nose. And I put a little picture. I was trying to find a, you know, a cartoon character. You know when they get really upset? What happens? Smoke comes out of their nose, right? Isn't that what happens? They turn red. And, been, and you see a little baby here with the smoke coming out. A cartoon is a cartoon, right? So the cartoons, yeah, the smoke comes out of their nose. So the idea here is Mashiach is going to have that power to prevent, so to speak, when Moshe went to God and he's like, please, for the Jewish people, he calmed him down. God was angry. Moshe had that power. So there's a lot of connections between, again, it's important because all of these concepts are like really all interchangeable. But the most important thing that you got to learn is what the tzaddik represents, and the tzaddik represents prayer. He's a Mashiach figure. He's Moshe figure. He's a tzaddik emet figure. He represents the nose, which represents the prayer. He calms down the anger. He's an important person that you need to take your tefillahs for to calm Hashem down. There's a lot to be said about these things. Let's go to page number three, where the Talmud teaches. Basic ideas. It says the Talmud teaches, bind yourself to God's attributes. Is that what you got there? Is that page four? Page four? Yeah. Sorry, page four. The Talmud teaches, bind yourself. Gamora, guys. Gamora. The Talmud teaches, bind yourself to God's attributes. Just as he is compassionate, so should you be compassionate. Just as he's kind, I spelled that wrong. Just as he's kind, so should you be. Right? We learn in a, in a very incredible book called Tomer Devorah. Tomer Devorah is an incredible book to start learning during the month of Elul. It's literally learning all of God's characteristics and learning how to be like him. Okay? But that's a way you connect to Hashem. You connect by being like Hashem. You are literally getting a part of Hashem by you being like him. Continues, and I said, look at Sita, the bond we create with the tzaddik is also, just like you connect with Hashem spiritually by acting like Hashem, the same with the tzaddik. You're creating a spiritual bond with the tzaddik. The same bond you want to create with Hashem, same thing. How, does, how do you spiritually connect with Hashem? Our sages teach by following God's example. The same way, you have to assume the attributes of the tzaddik. Being compassionate and kind, like I said, we become attached to Hashem spiritually. And we become godly. The same holds to binding ourselves to the tzaddik. By following the tzaddik's example and attributes, accepting his advice and following it, we are bound to the tzaddik. We become attached spiritually to him and we become tzaddik-like. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another snippet. Likute Moharan, chapter seven, section three. Rabbi Nachman says, "Ve'iev shar labole emet ela ayidei hit kabru letzadiki." You want truth? Behold, fine. Let's do like this. Sorry. "Ve'iev shar labole emet ela ayidei hit kabru letzadiki." You want to get to the truth? You want to get to that point? You got to do it by binding yourself to the tzadiki. "Ve'yelech b'derech atzata ve'ayidei shem kabel mechem atzata." Basically, you got to go and follow their advice. And you got to follow their advice in truth. He says, let's read it in English. He brings you a Pasuk. Behold, you want truth in the inner parts? In the innermost places, teach me. This is the Pasuk from Tehillim. Teach me wisdom. It's impossible to achieve truth except through attachment to the Tzaddikim and by following their advice. The person who accepts their advice has the truth etched. The truth is etched inside of him. As it's written, behold, you want truth? when You can't handle the truth. That's what I came thinking the whole time. You can handle the truth. When truth is what you desire in the inner parts, look at the Pasuk and Tehillim, in the inner parts, in the innermost places, teach me wisdom. For the advice received from the Tzaddikim is an aspect of marriage and union of holiness. Another interesting way of looking at it. It's literally like a marriage. Can you imagine that? Like, I've looked at a tzaddik like a marriage. Yes. You're forming a bond with a tzaddik. And met. The truth. What happens in a relationship between a husband and a wife? Right? 
It's got to be based on one thing, honesty. Yes, it's honesty, right? And that is the bond that helps connect the marriage. If there's no honesty, it's game over, right? The same thing happens when in a relationship when it comes to the tzaddik. The tzaddik is literally, once you start learning, like, again, you get connected to so many different books. I can talk to you, get this book, start up with that book. When you start learning the advice of the tzaddik and you are literally hitting the pavement, you're going to start seeing and feeling something you haven't felt before. A level of awakeness, a light that comes inside of you. Where is that coming from? It's coming from the, the tzaddik and it's real and it's tangible and it's hard to explain it sometimes. And that's that concept of like that marriage because it really becomes, especially as you go through the process, you're going to see you really feel a bond and a connection to the tzaddik and it's real. And that's the beautiful idea. You have a union of holiness. When you talk about man and wife, we have a union of holiness. Talk about another union of holiness, you and a tzaddik. It's all about Kedusha. So that's chapter seven. Chapter, sorry? Holiness. Yeah. Take a look at Likutei Moharan, chapter 123. Rabbi Nachman says here, again, I'm only taking snippets from the chapters. When we go through a full chapter, it's amazing. But we'll just take snippets. The essence and foundation on which everything depends. That's a big statement. Is binding oneself to the tzaddik of the generation. With a couple of Let me stop there. Sorry. Again, look at the notes. There's a book called Tzaddik, which is about the life of Rabbi Nachman. Incredible book. Less than 320. Look what he says. Rabbi Nachman once said, anyone who will just listen to me, and fulfill whatever I tell him will certainly become a very great tzaddik. And we see that many people that follow the path of Rabbi Nachman become high level individuals. And not only a high level individual, but it's like a different consciousness, like a different world. Like, and, and, and I say this again, when I say this, I know I'm, 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 I'm a tzaddik, not even close, not even there. I don't know what you're talking about. But one thing's for sure. So when I read this stuff, you have to understand, I'm coming at you from a place of experience. I'm not coming at you like, oh, we're just going to read tonight's work and very nice. I'm coming from at it where I've been practicing this stuff now for six years and it's an incredible change in a person's life. It's hard to explain it, but the growth is like this. Like that's what people want. You're, the whole point of why you're here in this world is to get close to Hashem. That's the whole point of why you're here. That's it. So if that's the golden rule, why you're here, the whole point of life, the trajectory should be like this. I, that's my whole life. I'm just trying to get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. That's what the Tariq does. That's what Rabbi Nachman of Breslov does. He continues and he says, accepting his word. This is, this is hard stuff what he's going to say. Accepting his word and whatever he says, this is how it is in matters small and great not deviating, Shalom, God forbid, from his word to the right or to the left. And he brings you a Pasuk in Dvarim from Deuteronomy. As our sages teach, even if he tells you that right is left, that's, which is from Sifri. Sifri is one of the commentators. Even if he tells you, no, right is left, you have to be like, okay, <laughs> what? Look at, look at the gray, look what it says. Our sages teach that when a person asks a question of the leading sage of the generation, this is in the Gemara, in the Gemara, guys. So I'm not talking out of nowhere. Our sages see that when a person asks a question of the leading sage of the generation, he should accept the reply and not deviate from it to the right or to the left. That's where he came from. That's why he was quoting that. That's in Masechah Rosh Hashanah 25b. So if somebody's telling you, a high-level sage is telling you to do something, you don't second-guess. The Sifre, which is a commentator, says that even if it appears from the answer that right is left and left is right, he is to accept the word as final. In spirituality, let's be honest. Okay, I have to be honest. How sure are you really of your ideas? How sure are you? People go into spirituality and go, well, yeah, you know, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to listen to this one and then I'm going to move with that one. Yeah. Like how much do you really know? Right? One of the commentators, Onik Shabbat, explains what is this is beautiful. Right and left. What this whole thing about right and left. Look what he says. Our sages teach that the left hand 
should push away. Left hand in, in the Kabbalistic concept, left represents gevura, <laughs> difficulties, challenge, discipline. The left pushes away and the right hand draws you close. The right hand represents chesed, kindness, brings you in. That's from a Sechesot in the Gemara. A person can mistaken about what does, a person can be mistaken about what does, he deserves to be, no, that's not what it says. A person can mistake about what deserves to be drawn closer and what needs to be repelled. However, listen to the tzaddik, you will not make a mistake. Meaning, I think that if I do this, that's going to draw me closer. And if I do this, that's going to sort of get me further apart from Hashem. Right? This is what I think. This is how I want to do it. it so based upon this idea of that concept, and especially a person who, listen, there's different people that are in different aspects of Judaism. That's why this class is very like, everybody has their own levels of where they're at. But if you still think that you know you got this, and I know 100%, this is my dare, this is my way, right? How sure are you really? How much do you really know? Is, are you growing a lot in that specific derech that you're in? Again, to listen to the advice of the tzaddik, so to speak, you will not make a mistake. Now, this one is a, a tough one for some people. Rabbi Nachman continues. He says, casting off, this is, so number one is, Accepting whatever the tzaddik says, no matter what it is. What, what he says? Yes, sir. That's one. Two, casting off from oneself all pseudo-wisdoms. What does pseudo-wisdoms mean? Chok, the, the wording Rabbi Nachman uses is chachmat. Chachmat. Chachmas. What is that? Chachmas are called pseudo-wisdoms. A person with chachma behaves with sophistication as opposed to simplicity. Simplicity is a very, very important conversation and topic that Rabbi Nachman stresses all the time. Serve Hashem with simplicity. Don't overcomplicate things. Pashut, emuna. We spoke about this last week. Faith and emuna, right? What happens? We are, we come from a, a, a a society, oh, we have to be very sophisticated. Everything has to have to think about it once, twice, here, there. This applies even to the path of wisdom in serving God. If they involve sophisticated reasoning, they are pseudo wisdoms and not true pathways to God. Now, this is the big thing. Rabbi Nachman is all out on this. In other teachings, Rabbi Nachman calls Chachmat a so called wisdom produced by philosophical inquiry. Even the secular wisdom of the sciences. So philosophy is a big eh in Brussels. We don't look at philosophical books. Why? Very simply. How much irat shemaim are you going to be about guessing once, twice, second time, three times, four times? Yes, no. Well, maybe philosophy. Is, and, uh, and again, we're talking about not only on a philosophical on books that are done by secular people. For sure that. But even in sometimes in Jewish philosophy, right? Rabbi Nachman was very much against, um, even though Ram, the Rambam is a high level tzaddik, nothing to dispute, right? Morei HaNevuchim, which is a very uh, philosophical book he wrote, he goes, that is a big no-no. Work, learn the Zohar, learn Kabbalah, learn things that are gonna give you irat shemaim and, and fear of Hashem and love of Hashem. Why do you have to go into like all these like, Yes, and no, and then this, and science also, sorry, Doc. So, <laughs> so the science is also, right? We, we're seeing it now more than ever. We're seeing that with science, right? It's doctors say, this is the science. And then what happens 30 years later? No, we were wrong. This is the science. And then, then oh, no, this is the science. And don't get me started about what's going on in the last two years, right? With COVID and this science and that science, and then they're being proven wrong. But I want to go there. But the truth of the matter is you see that it's false. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of falsehood sometimes in it. There's truths in it and there's falsehoods. So Rabbi Nachman was very clear. Learn things that are going to give you Yerach Hashem. Learn things that are going to make you think about Hashem in a good way, in a positive way. Not second guess your own religion. Stay away from that. Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, and dismissing one's knowledge as if one had no intelligence other than what one receives from the tzaddik and the rav of the generation. Because as long as one retains some of one's own intellect, one lacks completion, is not bound to the tzaddik. What does that mean? 
You really want to do this? You really want to do this? You have to go all in, immerse yourself, and literally press a reset button on everything you learned. Not easy. Check it out. Rab Nassim of Breslau. Okay? I mentioned him before. The greatest student Rabbi Nachman had. Okay? The amount of books that he's put out. I'm telling you, well-respected in every single Hasidic circle. He, at 22 years old, everybody knew about him before he even knew about Rabbi Nachman. What? Was one of the main top students. He knew Gemara, cold. He knew Halacha, cold. Goes to Rabbi Nachman, sees the, the fire that's coming out of him, and like, it went like, phew, to him like this. And he has that famous song, right? The Breslev Boed Esh, meaning in Breslev, there's a fire, pour it in my heart. He felt something he never felt before. Where was this been in my whole life? And this is talking about a high level individual. What did he say he did? He threw away his entire knowledge. Completely said, reset button, whatever I knew before, I don't know nothing now. I'm going to literally listen to what the tzaddik has to say. Okay, and when he did that, I, you could see that I wrote in the notes there. It's a very well-known thing. The Breslers of the elders of Breslau, everybody knew that he was, because he did that, because he nullified himself completely, he was able to retain and get the most information from him and literally bond with him on a level that was unparalleled. And is, there's some notes I read, you know, like, again, some elders are elders and they're older and they have their things and they have their ways. And, you know, like, sometimes it's hard to change somebody sometimes. And I get it. And that's why they, they, they of course, Rabbi Nachman, wow, but they weren't all in. And that all in didn't let them get to that high level. Now, when you think about that high level, I also want to give you examples. You speak about Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nachman. Again, we can strive to be Rabbi Nachman. We can strive to be in that level. But I'm saying to you also, we have the famous Sadiq student bonds. You have Moshe Rabbeinu Yehoshua. So Yehoshua literally was at the becking call of whatever Moshe Rabbeinu said, did, or what. He says he literally was like lying down like at his tent, waiting. That's a very perfect, perfect example. And we know who Yehoshua was, right? And you have the famous the Arizal, the Arizal, of course, right? From, from Sfat. His main student, Rab Chaim Vital, literally immersed himself in everything the Arizal said, breathed. He actually was the one who also helped write down everything for him. We're talking about one of the highest level scholars. So it's not the first time I've seen something like this, but there's a thing, just being able to subject yourself to the tzaddik, Moshe being a tzaddik, the Arizal being a tzaddik, as examples, right? <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman continues and he says, next page, and I'll read it to you in English. Because I see we're running short on time. My 45 minutes definitely did not become 45 minutes. <laughs> when the Jewish people received the Torah, I'm going to read it to you in English. They possess great pseudo-wisdoms. For then, the mistakes of those who served idolatry at that time stem from great pseudo-wisdoms and philosophies, as is known. Had Israel not cast off themselves the pseudo-wisdoms, they would not have received the Torah. The Erev Rab. Are you guys familiar with the Erev Rab? There were a mixed multitude of people, the Jewish people, that were really the troublemakers in the desert. Okay? And to this day, the Erev Rab is out full strength. You see them in the government. They're in the politics. They're, you see them as, unfortunately, you'll see them in the celebrity world. These are Jewish people that are in the mix, and they're the ones that are very anti-Torah. Okay? They're all over the place. What's the name of them? Erev Rab. So they were, you know, the ones that created the problems. They were the ones that started with the golden calf. Guys, we got to hurry up. We can't, this is, Moshe's has already been gone for too long. They created a lot of issues. So look what he says. Had Israel not, so basically, if Israel would not have actually, these are pseudo wisdoms that these people brought. If they would not be able to get them off their back, they would have, if they would have denied everything, then they would not have gone to Torah. All that Moshe Rabbeinu did with them would have been of no help to them. Even all the signs and awesome wonders, which he performed before their very eyes, and so many miracles for them, would not have helped them. By the way, that's scary. Think about that for a second. Thank God, Baruch Hashem, right? The Jewish people were able to follow. Today as well, there are heretics who deny God based on the foolishness and error of their pseudo-wisdoms. My goodness, I just saw the other day, and I, you know what? I'm going to say it right now. And I, 
There's an Israeli guy who works for the World Economic Forum, going blank on his name right now. And he literally, I just saw the interview and he says, we need to make ourselves bigger than God. We can now create robots. We can do this. He's literally saying like, we have the capacity to be live forever. We're, we're going to be gods. This is what's coming out of these people's mouth. By the way, Israeli guy. Scary. So Rabbi Nachman, based on that, he says, sorry, lost my place. He says as follows. But Israel is a holy people. They saw the truth and cast up the pseudo wisdoms and believed in God. Is a very famous saying. Vayaminu be Hashem Moshe Abdo. Wait, why does it say that? Why can't you say they believed in Hashem? They believed in Hashem Moshe Abdo. Who's Moshe? The Tzadik, Mashiach figure. Yeah? Prayer, no, right? All these concepts, right? It's, a, it's important. What does the Mechilta teach us? Mechilta is a teaching of like Midrashic laws. Whoever believes in the faithful servant, a.k.a. Moshe Rabbeinu, is as if he believes in God. Ah. Whoever believes in God, it's as if he believes in the faithful servant. It's because believing in the true tzaddik with total simplicity is what brings a person to believe in God and to serve him. When you start following the path of the tzaddik, it creates a higher level of irat shamayim and helps you to start serving Hashem on a higher level. And look what, that, what it says. Rabbi Nachman finished that last line. Through this, they received the Torah. When they believed in Hashem, then they got the Torah. What does the Torah mean? When you get the Torah, it means I get the Torah. I, I'm able now to connect to Hashem. Look at that last line I wrote. We will do and we will listen. Moshe spoke about serving God and they believed him. They trusted completely in the tzaddik. And the Midrash teaches, it's in the Shochar Tov, the Jews received the Torah. Look at the terminology. The Jews received the Torah with simplicity. A lot of very plug and play concepts. Simplicity, serving Hashem with simplicity, believing in the tzaddik, pure pashut simplicity. You say this, I say yes. Whatever you say, because you know what's best for me, not because I know what's best for me. And that requires also a lot of humility, which is an important trait that a person must have because if you have humility, Hashem wants to hang out with you. You have to learn how to nullify yourself. Next page. 650. Okay, we're doing good. Rabban Gamliel Hayal Mer. Asa lecha rab. Very famous pasuk. Pirkei Avot, guys. Asa lecha rab. Behistalik min asafek. Be'al tarbel le'aser ad amodot. Rabban Gamliel used to say, appoint for yourself a teacher. Avoid doubt. And do not make a habit of tithing. Okay. The important lines that we're looking at right now are the two. Appoint yourself a Rav. Get yourself a teacher. And avoid doubt. A tzaddik will guide you onto the correct path for the rectification and perfection of your soul. That's a big statement. I'll repeat that again. A tzaddik will guide you on the correct path for the rectification and perfection of soul. Do you understand that we're, I mentioned this also before. This is not our first time in this world. We are reincarnations. We are reincarnations, right? This is not our first go around. And guess what that means? We are here. Well, part of the reason is we're here to get close to Hashem. And part two is we have rectifications that, that we do in this world. There are things that we have to work on that we messed up in our previous lifetime. Who's going to show me what they are? Who's going to bring it out of me? The tzaddik. Because the more you learn... In your soul, in your heart, things will start happening and you'll know, you'll know what things you need to work on. It happens. The tzaddik knows the source of each person's soul and the place in heaven to which it has to reach. So the tzaddik can give you proper direction. He can reveal the fear and love that already exists in you and he can reveal the inner beauty and grace of your soul. Amazing. And remember, and, why, and how is that possible? Because again, the human body is one body. Red, the tzaddik is all the way in the brain. He knows what's going on. But you're going to ask people, Michael, the, 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 the tzaddik's not alive. How is he going to know? 
And my answer to you, and only I could only say it to you in simplicity and honesty and pure humility, the more you learn, you will see. The messages will come. That's the truth. This is the story from Chaye Moharan, number 544, The Life of Rabbi Nachman. We're going to read it because it's a cute story. And then the last part, I think we're almost, yeah. And then we'll have one more thing and we're done for tonight. Chaye Moharan. The Rebbe said, when a person is close to a true tzaddik for many years and attends to his needs and listen to what, and listens to what he says, he may hear all kinds of remarks and conversations and stories that seem to him to have no relevance to him nor anything to offer him in the way of spiritual guidance. With the passage of time, however, he may eventually come to realize how to derive the most valuable spiritual guidance from all the different things he heard long before. He will then see how every word he heard, even many years earlier, has the greater relevance to him. And he will be able to derive inspiration from every single one. He will finally understand and say, so this is what my teacher was hinting to me then. With each new situation he finds himself in, it will dawn on him how everything he, everything he heard long ago contained all kinds of wonderful hints and guidance if he just thinks carefully about everything he heard. The Rebbe illustrated a story about a, a story about a well-known tzaddik whose household included someone who was very simple, what they call a prostic, a simple guy, posh guy. This man attended the tzaddik constantly and he heard a great deal from him, but he understood nothing and did not see any relevance in what he heard. Amy, are you listening? You are listening to what I'm saying, right? The man at the tent, did you hear what? He understood nothing and he did not see any relevance in what he heard. Nevertheless, he had great faith in the tzaddik and his holy words, even without understanding their true meaning. He would just stand there and attend to the tzaddik's needs with complete sincerity. Very nice. After many years, the tzaddik died. This tzaddik is Rabbi Nachman. The man then started remembering all kinds of things he had heard. In every situation, he found himself remembering something the tzaddik had said and would say to himself, so this is what the tzaddik meant. What he said on such and such occasion was a hint. And with each new developing, he understood in retrospect what the tzaddik had meant and what he had been hinting to in all this year before. And now he understood. And what happened, this guy became a super deeply pious person, God-fearing, great respect in the town. He was a tzaddik. He became the leader of all the sincerely religious people there. And they all followed him. And all I can tell you on that is like this. And, and this is an example. And I go, for those people who lived with me through the process, my house burned down a year ago. And when that happened, you saw, and I, and I went and I lived through it all, telling you the Torahs that I'm learning with Likute Maharan, how they've all been connected with my life. And as we're going, and I'm like going from one chapter to another chapter, I'm like, oh my God, now this, now this is about me again. Oh my God. You're like literally like as if he's sending you the messages and you're like this, this is crazy. So I'm talking about it from a personal level. So when I read this, I'm like, yep, I totally get it. I'm not talking about it from a level of like, oh, that sounds nice. Like I lived through it. And you see that the more you, I can go back to a chapter that I'm learning with somebody else and I'm like, oh my God, like this totally is so right now what I needed to hear. And I already read this chapter before. And at that time I didn't go, oh my God. But like at this point, I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. So the Rebbe, through Hashem, through Hashem specifically, the words of the tzaddik can go to you. You don't have to like literally, uh, how do I talk to him? It just comes to you. You'll see it. And this part is the, this part, that I'm read you right now, Sichot Aran, Rabbi Nachman's Wisdom, an incredible book. I highly recommend. It's an example of taking a book of advice, wisdom. Number 79. This, guys, is the one that's like tough. This is, this is not a good info. This is not a good commercial. Um, <laughs> and I say this in a, in a joking around manner because we're going to read through it. And I'm also going to tell you that I've seen a little bit of this, but I also want you to know it's for your best. Here we go. Ready? Last page. Sikhot Aran, number 79. Hashem. <clears throat> when one begins to truly serve God, by the way, that's a big statement, truly serve God. And you attach yourself to a great tzaddik. Not always, but sometimes. One is often filled with great confusion and evil thoughts. <clears throat> Number 80. 
the evil, it says the evil was there, but now, only now it's surfacing. So when, what does that mean, first of all, when you're learning and then you're like, oh man, I'm really, like you start thinking about where you're at right now in life and you're like, oh my God, you know? So automatically you start thinking about like, I got ways to go. That's one thing. Confusion, evil thoughts. What, what am I doing? Am I, am I really, should I be really be listening to this? Like there's a lot of like confusion in the beginning. Zekemol lemashal, klimaim. This is like a pot of water that may seem perfectly clear. You put pot, put the water, what happens? When you put the water and you, now you put it on fire and it begins to boil, okay? What happens? All the impurities are brought to the surface. You ever see when you put water in a pot and like little thingies start coming to the top sometimes? You ever notice that? Yeah? All the impurities come all the way to the top. One must stand by and constantly remove these impurities. The original purity that you had, the water that's sitting on a pot, is just an illusion. Meaning you think your life right now is nice and it's perfect, I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, that's an illusion. You get close to the tzaddik. What happens with a little bit of heat, the impurity surfaces, but when these impurities are removed, the water is truly pure and clear. Okay, now keep going. Hold on. I'm gonna just now I'm gonna just read it in English for you guys. The same is true of a person. Before he begins to serve God, good and evil are completely mixed together with him. That's the water by itself, chilling in a pot. That's your illusion. Okay, good and evil together with me. Turn on that fire. What happens? The impurities are so the impurities are so closely united with the good, they cannot be recognized. I didn't even know that I had these on me, these impurities. Then the person comes close to a true tzaddik, and you begin to burn with great feeling toward God. That's what I said. He brings a fire in your heart. That's what Rabbi Nachman does. A fire. That's the fire from the pot. And you're touched by the heat of purification, and all the evil impurities come to the surface. Here again, what happens? One must stand by and constantly remove the dirt and impurities as they appear. And then what happens to you at the end? The person is truly pure and clear. Purification, when a person is going through purification, guys, it requires agitation and confusion. And in the beginning, a person is totally immersed in the material world. This is one of the things that's going to happen when you do get into the world of really connecting. You start seeing and your eyes really open up to the materialism that's in the world. Now you can look at it even from a surface level. Yeah, it's my, you're materialistic. But when you get into the world of spirituality, and I'm talking about immersing yourself all in, you really start, every action you make is now you start looking at things from a different light. We speak about this in all our classes, the different aspects of your life that are represented by that. But then you start becoming really close to God. When you get all that schmutz off of you, Right? Once you get close to the tzaddik, it would happen. It would seem possible to remove this dirt and impurity at once from those who abandon material pursuits and begin to serve God. You think, you know what, I'm just going to live a, a life of like, you know, I'm not going to be materialistic at all. And you think, okay, I'm just going to do that. And therefore now I can get close to Hashem. But the person's mind is completely intermingled. You think that just because you're doing that, oh, I'm not really connected to materialism. Where it be to be removed immediately, his mind would be drawn out with it. Point of the matter is that tzaddik is the one who helps you slowly but surely get rid of all the impurifications that you have. Unfortunately, when that happens, you find sometimes that when you start getting close to the tzaddik and you're going through purification process, challenges come your way. That's not easy to say that because it's, there's some truth there. But you have to know it's like anything else. When a person after 120 years goes to Gehenna, that's for Sean, should not go to Gehenna. That's not what I mean. Well, if you have to go to Gehenna, what is happening in Gehenna? You're being purified from all the sins that you did. That's what happens in Gehenna. 
That's the whole point. So now you're, so to speak, the, the tzaddik, by you getting close to him, you are now going through these difficulties, so to speak, but all of it is part of the process in regards to purifying your soul. So you really are, so to speak, now living a higher level of spirituality because we've been so sucked on to our materialistic who we are. And now you can live a real godly life and your awareness and your consciousness changes and you're a different person. And Judaism isn't anymore like, oh, I got to go pray. Oh, I got to go to a class. Oh, I got to. It's like, how can I go talk to Hashem next? And how can I learn another Torah class now? And how do you, you know what I'm saying? Like everything becomes amazing. You look at the world, material, the materialistic, like I just, I joke around about it. When you eat, you're now very conscious about when I eat, what am I eating? How am I eating? What am I eating for? Right? When you're listening to music, we spoke about this in the class of music, how, how, how important it is to listen to, to pure music. And when you listen to wrong music, it affects your soul. There's so many different aspects of your life. And I can touch on a million of them. We're not going to do that right now. Maybe there's 27 of these ideas and concepts that we're going to learn about will, will be all, you know, all encompassing into this idea. But to finish off, to finish off tonight's class, I just want to say that I sparked through from the beginning. Bind yourself to the tzaddik. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. So what does that mean? To recap, number one, and if you want, again, if you guys are in the Breast of Light WhatsApp group, I recommend you join for future class announcement, announcements and to watch the replays of classes you want to share with people, etc. I will put the exact prayer that you say in the morning. And now there's people in the Breast of Light that say, oh, every prayer before I pray, I'm going to say, Hareni Mekasher, it's maybe... I just said basically, I'm going to buy myself. It's all the tzaddikim that are alive, the ones that are not alive, including Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, that's his mom, Fega, uh, the, the, the flowing source of wisdom, and it should be a merit for me. Okay, pretty much that's what I said. So when you're saying that, you're consciously saying that, and you're in your mind, you're saying that. And you're, and you're saying that because, again, you're hoping that he can help you to elevate your prayers. That's number one. Two, learning his Torahs. Learning his Torahs and, and, and not only learning it, internalizing it, going through them. I know I learn individually with a lot of people. You can see. You ask them. They Just learning a little bit. And you're like, huh? It's like, whoa, what was that? You know, like, that was awesome. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. So internalizing it, learning it. Again, when you're learning the Kutema Haran, for example, you're looking at the face of the tzaddik, you'll see that the messages can come in, they come in clear. And on top of that is acting upon them. Follow the advice. Listen to what the tzaddik says. And you'll see that as if you do this and you immerse yourself all into it, it will change your life. It will make you, really give you the best chance. I look at it like this. It gives you your best chance to succeed in life, to get as close as possible to Hashem, to fulfill all the rectifications you have to do in this world, and to make it to a high level, in, in not only in this world, but in Olam Haba. That's why we're here, right? It's part of the whole mission statement, right? So I hope that's a good chiddush and idea of number one, binding yourself to the tzaddik. Next week, just to give you an idea, oh, the next week I'm going to New York. I might be giving a class in New York you know, people that are there. I don't know when, when, how, why, but we'll get working on that. Um, we're going to talk about Mariv, the evening prayer. We're going to learn about that more in depth. We're going to talk about, and these are things that rest of us do. Okay, Mariv prayer. Thank you, Michael. No, it's it's Mariv prayer. <laughs> it's not Mariv. It's Mariv prayer. Are you kidding me? We're praying to Hashem at nighttime? Kriyat Shema before going to sleep. How important it is to say the Kriyat Shema before going to sleep. I'm talking to myself. No. How important it is to say the Kriyat Shema before going to sleep. What it does, what does it do? What's happening when I'm doing that? And, and I think with those two, and maybe the last one we'll talk about next week is the concept of making a reckoning, which means really introspecting on yourself daily. What did I do good today? What did I not do good today? What can I work on today? Hashem, forgive me. We'll talk about all those things. I think that'll be for next class next week. So thank you very much for you guys watching online. If you guys want to hang around and wait 30 minutes or not 10 minutes, I'll be with you guys in a couple of minutes. 
and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful night.